All right. Hi, everybody. This is Apostle Misha Softier welcoming you to our study in the Word Sunday edition at 8 p.m. tonight. And uh, it's hard to do redos um, because I tried to do this earlier and we had like two or three power in, uh, outages and interruptions and, and and things like that. And it caused a few people to get knocked off of the program. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I'm just not going to let Satan have his way. And I, <laughs> I'm out of breath, you know, from doing this. I, I brought I brought this message this morning at a church, uh, one of the churches that we were ministering at uh, in a live service. I'm not going to say where because of all the junk that's going on here in the state of California right now, but it was well attended and it was an excellent message and very well received. And uh, so I'm going to bring it again Tonight, for those that have the benefit that uh, that we're not able to hear the message, uh, because I hope that it will also be an encouragement uh, to each one of you. Okay, and um, so the title of the, the message, is, it's on here, and I forgot what my title was, but basically it has to do with not being overtaken by our past. And many, many times, folks, as Christians, we do worry about that. There are Christians that are worried about being taken uh, over by their past and uh, that the past will catch up with them. The past will um, uh, recapture them or they'll be re-ensnared to old bondages and old habits. And <clears throat> it's, a, I guess, a legitimate concern. Um, I think on one hand, it's good to remember where we came from. It's not bad to... Uh, uh, forget the whips that beat our backs in Egypt when we were out there in the world and remember how bad things were for us out there and how good things are for us, thank God, as Christians today. <clears throat> On the other hand, though, <clears throat> we're not to walk in fear. We're not to fear uh, the enemy and, and have fear that Satan is going to re-ensnare us into our past. <clears throat> Christ was led out to the wilderness and tempted in the wilderness during that time, he overcame the temptations and that Satan brought to him. One of the uh, authors, either Matthew or Mark, maybe maybe Luke or John, one of the four, <clears throat> he, he, he talks about that particular situation and says, and, and then Satan departed until an opportune time. So folks, the devil is always looking for that opportune time to come back and to re-ensnare you. And we wonder, well, are there passages or is there are there any stories in Scripture that might line up with, with something like that that I could look at that would give me something to think about? And there really are. And uh, one of my favorites and one that I want to share with you tonight is in Exodus, okay? And it act will actually begin in Exodus chapter 13, 21, and then we'll go into Exodus chapter 14, Okay, um, but I want to begin, actually, I, I started this differently last time, and every time I bring a message, I bring it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and God always leads me differently. And I do pray, as we enter into this, Lord, that you will have your way. Every spirit of distraction will be bound. This time, Lord, we're not going to have power outages, and the power of the Holy Spirit will prevail, Lord, over this for every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray, and I thank you for it. Amen. All right, now I want to read this, okay? I want to stop, uh, go first ahead of ourselves and go into ch chapter 14. And I'm going to read from verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, stand still, okay, or stand by, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Okay? The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Folks, if that's not the past trying to creep up on you and God trying to tell you, you ain't got nothing to worry about, I don't know what is. Okay? Because here it is. Okay? The Egyptians that you saw today or the Egyptians that you saw yesterday, you'll never see them again. He says today in this case because they had just been delivered. Um, uh, Pharaoh had gone through a, a number of plagues and uh, him and his people and he continued to harden his heart. And as you know the story, he refused. He wouldn't let the people go. 
And then um, finally he, he acquiesced and said, okay, you know, go, get out of here, leave me alone. His, his, his firstborn had died, you know, and he just wanted to, he didn't want nothing to do with the Jews. Take whatever you want, you take half of whatever belongs to us too, or whatever you want to take, just get out of here and don't come back. And, and, um, and so that was Pharaoh's attitude, but the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And really, really what it was was that Pharaoh's heart was already hardened against against the Jews and against the Israelites. He, he didn't want to let them go. He felt like he had no choice to do but to do it. And so his heart was hardened. He thought, what have I done? You know, I've had, I've got years and years of, of slave slaves that were rebuilding everything for us, and all of a sudden they're gone. Where are we going to get the labor? We need to go back and get those guys. Either kill them or get them, but we need to get them back here if we can. And so he, he hardened his heart, and he goes after them. Okay, now... As the Israelites are leaving Egypt, okay, we go to chapter 13. Now, we'll go backpedal a little bit, okay, and we read from verse 21, where he says, The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day and led them on the way, and in, and, uh, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So, again, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. When did this happen? It happened once the Israelites had left uh, with Moses and had left the Egyptian kingdom or the Egyptian palace or whatever you may want to call it. They were leaving. They were fleeing Egypt, okay? And they had had, had had wandered in a wilderness and they were heading towards the Dead Sea, okay? And at this particular time, they were being led. They did not know where they were going, okay? Moses did not say, you know what? We're going to take a trip and we're going to go make a two rights and a left here and we're going to end up at the Dead Sea with the wilderness to our backs and the Egyptians chasing us. He didn't have that plan. That wasn't in his plan. But sometimes God does things in ways that we maybe wouldn't do them in order that he could reveal himself. And he did reveal himself because you know the story. If you haven't read your Bible, but you watched the Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, you know what happened when he when Moses took that staff and he struck that, that, that sea and it spread and they walked across on dry land. And the Egyptians followed and they were consumed when the waves came tumbling down on top of them. We know the story. Okay, and, and you can read the story and you can read it to be a perfectly true story in the book of Exodus. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, a little bit of trivia for you here, but about a year ago or two years ago, I believe it was, archaeologists actually discovered and found chariots and swords and all types of things under the water in the Red Sea where this was supposedly, this incident supposedly took place. And that has been uncovered through archaeology. And so I think that's pretty powerful, don't you? Amen. If you think that's pretty powerful, give me a, a thumb or a smile or one of those hearts that you guys poof, shoot up every now and then. I love seeing those things. It lets me know people are listening. Okay, but uh, yeah, that that's what happened, okay, folks? And um, but, but, but what's so important here, okay, is what we're reading in 1321. They were not going alone. It wasn't just Moses leading them. And folks, today, it's not me or it's not just your pastors or different ones leading you, okay? Hopefully, hopefully, if they're doing the will of God and doing what God has called them to do, they're being led by that cloud by day and fire by night. But today we know it as the Holy Spirit, okay? Because the cloud by day and the fire by night was a type of the Holy Spirit leading the Israelites or the Jews out of Egypt, okay? And then guiding them as, as to where they should go, all right? And we're going to see uh, some unique things about this cloud by day and this fire by night as we continue to read. But in verse uh, 21 of 13, we see that the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day <clears throat> to lead them on the way and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they may travel by day and by night. They were traveling day and night to get out and to get away from Pharaoh. Okay? And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now we go into verse or into chapter 14. 
Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before uh, Pi uh, Hiriath, uh, between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of Bilsaphon, opposite it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say, and the Lord is telling uh, Moses exactly what Pharaoh is going to say, and so he's saying, Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they're wandering aimlessly in this land. The wilderness has shut them in. In other words, they got no place to go. If we want to go back and get them, we got them, man. We can, we, we, we can get them, and we can get them back. Okay? And so Pharaoh will say to the sons of Israel, they're wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Well, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened, but it would be hardened more. He had lost his firstborn son, and he let the Israelites go because of all the plagues and all the misery, but he let them go for that reason, not because he was doing it out of the kindness and gentleness and goodness of his heart, and he thought, geez, you know what? I think it's time for you to return to your land. We don't need slaves anymore. Now, that wasn't what was in Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh wanted them as slaves, but he did not want the plagues that Moses brought along in the name of the Lord with them, and so he let them go. But what happened was, Pharaoh, really deep within, didn't want to, to, to let them go. And so God went ahead and went with Pharaoh's will and allowed his heart to become hardened, okay? So he hardened his heart, okay? But it was something that God allowed to occur, all right? Um, and, so, and, and so we see Pharaoh's heart it would be hardened. Uh, verse 4, thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh, and all his army and Egyptians, and the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord, and they did so. Well, well how, how will God be honored through Pharaoh and all his army and through the Egyptians? Well, he would be honored because the Egyptians and Pharaoh and all his army would be destroyed. by the well, Because once the Israelites walked across the sea on dry land, and they tried to follow, and the sea swallowed them up, People would marvel and be amazed because there were neighboring tribes and there were neighbor, neighboring uh, uh, peoples that were not, uh, you know, around the, this land that they were in. They were in a wilderness. They were already out of Egypt. They were watching what was going on and watching this whole scenario. And, you know, rumor spreads, okay? And, and God was going to be glorified. No man will glory, but God will glory, be, be glorified. And so God was glorified in this situation. He was saying, I will glorify myself even through, through Pharaoh and through his chariots and through his soldiers and all the wickedness. I tell you what, folks, you know what? We see wickedness in the world today. We see wickedness in government today. We see well, a lot of wickedness taking place when we turn on the, uh, the television. But I want to tell you something this evening. God will be glorified in it. Okay, because God is God. He is greater than the devil. God has everything under control. And that's the thing that you need to realize. When you turn on the TV, whether it's CNN or NBC or ABC or Fox or any of the others, uh, I'm not going to pick favorites. I have my own that I like, and, some, and, and I've definitely got a lot of them that I dislike. But, folks, here's what I'm saying to you, okay? There's a lot of talking heads out there saying a lot of things. There are a lot of wicked people doing a lot of wicked things. But in the end of it all, we know how the book ends. God prevails, okay? And you need to remember that as a Christian walking with God. And if you're an unbeliever and you'd like to believe, maybe you believe, but you've not made that commitment to the Lord, folks, you need to know that we serve a living God and that we are watching prophecy be fulfilled every day. Every time you turn on your TV, you're seeing prophecies, things in the Bible that have been prophesied thousands of years ago coming to pass now, and you need to get on the right side of the fence, okay? The time for sitting on the fence with one foot in the church and one foot on the other side and out in the lawn or something is over. The Bible says in the last days, it will be evident the one who serves the Lord and the one who who does not. And the Lord says, I will in the last day separate the wheat from the chaff, or the wheat from the tares. You know, tares and wheat, they look alike when they're growing up, but once they get mature, there's a difference. Okay, and right now God is, is, is separating the true remnant church from the false harlot church, the church that will ride upon the beast, upon the Antichrist, that will actually align with the Antichrist, and the Antichrist will use that church, the Bible says, if you read the book of Revelation, the church rides upon the harlot, and then the harlot turns and devours her, okay? That, that, that's what happens. She rides upon the beast, the beast turns, devours her. That's going to be the end of the harlot church. 
The remnant church, however, an entirely different uh, story. We are, we, and I include myself in it because I'm not, I know I'm a part of that remnant church. We are victorious all the way through this. Okay. Are you part of the remnant church or are you part of the harlot church? Don't, don't answer me here. But I, you know, unless you tell me you're part of the remnant church, because I, I don't want to have to stop my message right here and start praying for people. Uh, you know, because I don't want a bunch of harlot church people come on saying, I'm part of the harlot church. No, but, but you know, there's, I, I kind of make fun of it, but there's a lot of people out there that aren't walking the way that they should walk that profess to be Christians. All right, but folks, we have something special, okay, because the true Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. I lost my spot here, so let me find it real quick. There it is. The, 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 um, the true Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. In the Old Testament days, in the times of Exodus, and when we saw we saw even the fire by night and the cloud by day, okay, that to me was a type of the Holy Spirit. And there were times that the Holy Spirit would rest upon men and rest upon certain people and rest upon prophets and things like that. But the Holy Spirit never remained. It didn't dwell and live within anybody, okay? That occurred in Acts chapter 2 when they gathered together in the upper room and they prayed and the Holy Spirit fell upon them as in cloven tongues of fire and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God of Christ dwelt within them, okay? When you initially accept Christ in your heart, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But when you're baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit, it's like the difference between having somebody dump a bucket of water on you and you being thrown into a swimming pool, okay? That's the difference between baptism in the Holy Spirit and having the Holy Spirit dwell in you, or, you know, in, 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 in certain degrees and certain measures. When you're baptized, I think you have a little more because you're usually open to a little more, you know, but... Um, that's another topic for another day, but uh, it would be sufficient to say that the cloud by day and the fire by night is typified uh, or a type of the Holy Spirit leading God's people out of Egypt, okay? And so we see in, in our reading in chapter 14 that, that, that the Lord spoke to Moses and told him, I'm going to move you over here to the ocean here because, you know, Pharaoh's coming after you. That didn't seem to me, and probably didn't seem like it to Moses to be the most strategic place to go. I mean, he might have been thinking, geez, you know, maybe we should get up here in the rocks somewhere, you know, or we could fight back or we could at least hide or something. But, but that's not what God said. God says, no, I want you right here on the beach. I want you on the beach with the ocean ahead of you and, and the wilderness and Pharaoh's armies coming from behind you. And believe me, there were some people that followed Moses that didn't like it too much, and we're going to see that. So verse 5 of fourteen, chapter 14 says this. It says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart. This is what we talked about. The Lord said he would allow his heart to be hardened. Pharaoh and his servants had that change of heart towards the people, and they said, what have we done that we have let Israel go from serving us? In other words, we just let our slaves of hundreds of years out of here. What are we doing? We need to get these guys back. Let's go back. Let's get them. If they, if, if they resist us, kill them. But they're not, they're not leaving. Now, he might have had murder in his heart, but I think he, he wanted his slaves back. He said, what have we done? Okay, let a, he said, what have we done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So his intent in going back after the Israelites really wasn't to kill them, but it was to recapture them and re-enslave them. Folks, how many of us worry sometimes about being recaptured and being re-enslaved from our past, okay? These, these Israelites were fleeing the Egyptians of their past because when they walked out of that palace or they walked out of that kingdom and left Egypt behind them, Egypt was in the past, okay? They were on their way to, you know, walking out boldly to a new life and to new beginnings, just like you when you ask Christ into your heart, okay? But they had no idea that, that Pharaoh was going to pursue them and come after them and try and recapture them again. And I think sometimes as Christians, we have no idea when we go and we ask the Lord in our hearts, we'd say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. You rose from the third day. You died for him. You for, uh, I ask you forgive me. I repent and I ask you into my life and so forth and so on. And we do that and we do it with all our heart. And we think that, well, you know, that's it. But we don't understand that there is a devil out there who is very real that wants to come and recapture us if we allow him to do it. And I want to make sure I emphasize that 
if we allow him to do it. I don't think Satan is going to recapture us um, if we if we're if we're not if we're not willing to go. Okay, but there are some Christians that play with God and they play with the devil. They look both ways. They're looking to the heavens when they pray, but they, like I say, got one foot in the church and one foot out. And sometimes they're looking back at their former life and the things that they miss and what they used to do. And they begin to flirt and they begin to think about things that they used to do in their former life. And the next thing you know, you know, the enemy has taken them. The Bible says that Satan comes at an, uh, most, uh, at an opportune time. When he left Jesus and Jesus was tempted on the mount, it says Satan departed and return, would return and, or looked or, or sought to return, I'm sorry, sought to return at an opportune time. He's always looking for an opportunity to come back. Pharaoh, in this story that we've read here, was looking for an opportunity, folks. He was looking for an opportunity to come back. He had let the Israelites go. Okay, the plagues caused them to do that. He didn't want them to go. He needed their, them as slaves and as servants, but he let them go. All right, but but when he realized what he had done and came to his senses, if you want to call it that, really God had hardened his heart even more. But when he realized what he had done, and the that that his whole kingdom was dependent upon these Jews for slavery because they had overpopulated in his kingdom after they had initially fled to Egypt from famine with Joseph, okay, and Joseph's family came, and you know the story about Joseph and all, and, and a lot of other people from Israel came because of a great famine in that land. They came to Egypt where the land was plentiful, and a lot of them settled down there and stayed there, and they became so populous that it came to a point that the Egyptians got together, their leaders, and said, we got to do something about this. There are so many Jews in our country, they could take over the country here. So they made a decision, and they made slaves out of them. So they were slaves for hundreds of years, okay? And they, if they walked out of the Egyptian kingdom, they wouldn't have known whether to go left or right, you know, or walk straight ahead and because they didn't know where to go. You know, they had been slaves for most of for probably all their lives, okay, and probably had never even been out the gates, but uh, unless it was with a slave master, master or a taskmaster. Okay, but anyway, so let's see, can we continue? So the king, the, the king realizes, the pharaoh, pharaoh realizes that, uh, you know, he, in his mind, he had made a mistake. What have we done? We've let Israel go from serving us. Verse 6, so he made his chariot ready, took his people with him, and uh, he took 600 select chariots and all uh, the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. The Israelites were still walking boldly. They were uh, happy to be free. They had, they had uh, felt they had accomplished a great victory over Egypt. They had no clue, no idea that Pharaoh was on, uh, had, had changed his mind and that was on his trail in coming after him. I wonder sometimes as Christians, we walk out boldly after we make our profession. Sometimes it's after our greatest victory that the enemy comes after us and wants to try to hit us because it's at that time that we're less aware. I think when the Israels went, Israelites left Egypt, they didn't even think, have an iota of an idea or worry or concern that Pharaoh would come after them. He was so soundly defeated and willing to let them go with all the booty and all the belongings, even of the Egyptians, he took them, they took them with them. The Israelites took that, okay? They weren't worried about Pharaoh coming back, all right? And I think many times as Christians, after some of our greatest victories, we're not worried about the past catching up or, or, or being tempted. And, and, and I've found, I know in my own life, I, I can't speak for you, but you can speak for yourself, but there have been many times it has been after the greatest victories that I've had that Satan has tried to come back and hit me. Because those are the times that I'm glorifying in the Lord and just saying, Lord, I love you, I worship you, I'm, I'm happy, I feel like I'm on top of the mountain. And the enemy sees that and he thinks, you know what, he's distracted right now, you know, maybe I can get him. You know, maybe this is a good time. He's not looking, he's not worrying, he's not praying. You know, because sometimes when we have our big victories, maybe we're praising God. At least that's what we should be doing. But some of us aren't. Some of us go through our big victories and we think we've got the battle won and we relax. We relax a little bit. We go, huh, now that I'm glad that's over with and that's the time, boom, my devil just side blindsides you. 
that he hits you. Boy, just like a linebacker, you know, uh, coming out of nowhere and hitting a quarterback who's just sitting back there in the pocket thinking everything's okay, and wham, he gets blindsided. That's what happens sometimes. And the enemy was coming. Pharaoh was coming, and the Egyptians, uh, the Israelites were walking out boldly, but here comes Pharaoh. He's after them again. Okay, and this time, he, he, he you know, he, he's, he's determined. Okay, for sure. All right, and so... Verse 9, then the Egyptians chased after the Israelites with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea besides Perioth in front of Bezal Pathan. Okay, and as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked. Uh oh. They looked. They saw. They looked behind them and go, whoa, we got trouble. T R O U B L E. <laughs> Trouble. They're coming. They're behind me. They're chasing us. And um, so he looked behind them, and the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. Okay? And they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out. So first they cried out to the Lord God, help us. God, help us. You know, you know we're being chased. I, I think they forgot all about the cloud by day and the fire by night at that point. They were worried. Because they saw Pharaoh and his army coming, and they were coming fast, apparently. Okay? Because it says they overtook them camping by the sea. So they were, and, and, and you got to remember the Israelites, they were, they had that cloud leading them day and night. They were, weren't just like traveling in the daytime and sleeping at night. They were traveling day and night to get out of there, and Pharaoh overtook them. So I would be venture to say, if we were to put this into a movie, Pharaoh was coming hard, and he was coming fast, okay? He was trying to overtake them, and he got, he got them. He got, got there. He got there when they were camped by the sea. I camped out on the beach, okay? And uh, the people, first they cried out to God, but then they, 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 they turned their anger towards, really towards Moses, towards the leader, towards their leader. And they, in doing that, they really turned their anger towards God because they said to Moses, verse 11, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in this wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Really? Really? They wanted to be left alone so they could serve the Egyptians? I don't think so. Maybe a mixed multitude of some of them did, but they, I think they wanted out, and they got out. But all of a sudden, they were crying sour grapes. They realized Pharaoh was after them, and they thought, man, we would have been better off back there. What are we doing here? We're going to get killed. Something bad is going to happen to us. We, it would have been better if we would have just stayed there. And they, they were having second thoughts, folks. Okay, and that's what happened. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And here we, we see the scripture that I read to you at the beginning. <clears throat> but Moses responded, okay, and he said to the people, Do not fear. Fear not. Folks, I, I want to say to you this evening, those of you that are worried about the Egyptians of your past creeping up on you, bearing down on you, coming after you, you're worried about the Egyptians of your past, okay? Do not fear. Moses says to them, do not fear. Stand by. Stand, in other versions of your scripture say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you will never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, forever, never, ever see them again, forever. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It's exactly that way. This is what it says, okay? It says, Do not fear, stand by, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you will never see them again, forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Okay, so let me see. Do I need to go any further? Yeah, let me let me read a little bit further, and then we're going to wrap this up. Okay, verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land, as for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all of his army 
through his chariots and his horsemen. Remember, we talked about that. How were they honored? Because all the other nations that were surrounding heard, got word. They heard the news. Pharaoh went after the Israelites, and guess what happened to him? And guess what happened to his army? The Israelites walked across on dry land, and once they got on the other side, Pharaoh went after them, and the sea caved in on them, and they are... They're still swimming somewhere or whatever. They're either drowned or they're they're swimming. But they didn't make it to the other side. Okay, so they so God was glorified, okay? And uh, so it goes, As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, verse 17, so that they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and his army and through his chariots and his horsemen. Verse 18, Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord <clears throat> when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. Verse 19. Now, this is what I want you to hear, folks, okay? This is kind of the key to the message, so you got to listen to this one. This should maybe maybe be one of those five-star scriptures that you want to underline your Bible. Use your yellow marker. Get your yellow marker out, okay, and start marking verses 19 and 20, okay? Listen to what happened here, okay, because, you see, something happened, okay? They were starting to go, okay, that Pharaoh had bore down on them, and and Moses had not yet tapped the water with his staff, okay? But he was he was getting ready to. But meanwhile, that cloud by day and that fire by night, something happened to it. And we're going to see verse nineteen: the angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from there, or moved from before them, and stood behind them. So it came between the camp. What came between the camp? The pillar and the cloud. Okay? That pillar and cloud came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there was the cloud, along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one, in other words, one side... Thus the one side did not come near the other side all night. Okay, so Moses was about had not stretched out his hand. Pharaoh had already arrived. He had arrived at nightfall. Okay, he could have attacked or wanted to attack or, or do whatever he w wanted to do, maybe recapture the Israelites at any point in time, but he could not do it. Why, folks? Because the... Uh, the cloud by day and the fire by night had moved away from the front where it was leading them and had dropped behind them and had protected them from Pharaoh's army. It stood between the Israelites and it stood behind their... He, God had their back, okay? It was he stood behind the Israelites and in front of Pharaoh's army and Pharaoh could not get through. He could not get to the Israelites. And those that wanted to desert, if there were any, couldn't get to, to Pharaoh either. They couldn't say, hey, we changed our mind, man. We're sorry about this. Please have mercy on us. They couldn't go either. There, there was a cloud by day and a fire by night that separated him, and Pharaoh couldn't go anywhere until God said, it's time. And so then we see, after that happened, okay, folks, that then Moses, verse 21, stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. Okay, so the waters were divided. Verse 22, the sons of Israel went through the mist uh, of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit. Now what happened? What happened? Well, the cloud by day and that fire by night let Pharaoh through. But it wasn't until the Egyptians, I mean, until the Israelites got to the other side. And so now here comes the Egyptians running through, thinking they're going to be able to go through right after them on the dry land. And Pharaoh was so determined. He, I think if I saw something like that, it would have scared me to death, especially if I was on the losing side of this. And given what Pharaoh had already experienced with all the plagues and everything else, I really would have thought twice before I stepped out on that uh, uh, <laughs> out on that dry land with an ocean on both sides because all the plagues came. They never plagued. Came, the Israelites weren't suffering. It was Pharaoh and the Egyptians that were. So when I saw that, I would have thought, this is a trick. I'm not going across, I think. But Pharaoh was so hardened and so determined 
to go after them that he went across and he he went anyway and he he tried to pass on that dry land also and those waves were all walled up high the bible says on both the left and on the right side waves were up like that and pharaoh said you know what i'm going i'm going we're going after him and he went right through there and i don't need to read any further okay the waves caved in and you know the rest of the story okay the the israelites made it to the other side and the Pharaoh's army didn't, okay? They didn't make it, all right? They were destroyed. They were wiped out, all right? But here's what I want you to know, folks. The cloud by day and the fire by night typifies the Holy Spirit for us today. And when we're worried about being recaptured by the Pharaohs and the Egyptians of yesterday's past, our past, okay? As long as we are obedient, desiring to do God's will. I believe the Holy Spirit that not only stands before us like the cloud by day and the fire by night that leads us forward in our walk with God will also cover our backs when the enemy tries to recapture us based on our past. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope that you do. Because that is how God moves, folks. That is the beauty of a relationship with the Lord. Remember Jesus when right 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 before he was crucified, he tells his disciples, I believe that I believe it was before his crucifixion, and I don't think it was after his resurrection, but it was right around the, that period of time. And he tells them, it's expedient that I go to the Father, because if I don't go, he will not send you the helper who will, you know, guide you and teach you and convict you of sin and teach you in the ways of righteousness and so forth and so forth. In other words, the helper, the that cloud by day and that fire by night, okay, would not dwell within us. And it dwells within us because of what Christ did on the cross. Folks, we, we, we don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to worry about being overtaken by the past unless you want to be overtaken. Those that are overtaken by the past, it, my experience has been in my own life um, before ministry and certainly in the lives of many, many, many people that I have counseled. They were overtaken by their past because they looked back at the past. It was almost like Abraham and Lot. They leave um, Sodom, I believe it was, right? Sodom. And Abraham and, and his family, they're, they're told, when you leave, just flee the city and, 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 and don't look back. Just, just go. Lot's wife looked back because, you see, there was still a little bit of too much Sodom in her heart. And, and, and she, she looked at what she was missing. She looked back. Even though she was told not to look back, and we know the story, she's turned into a pillar of salt. There are some today that are in the body of Christ, folks, and you're still looking back. I hate to say it, but it's true. There are some of us that are tempted at times to look back. <clears throat> we We really shouldn't. The Bible said that of I think the Lord said that the one that takes his plow and looks back is 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 not worthy of the kingdom of God. We, you, I, I had a funny experience that happened to me once, and I'm going to close with this because I've been going for a little while. But I'm just going a little bit while I'm spiting the power outage that knocked me out three times on my last broadcast, and I'm just saying there, just stick it because I'm going to speak and I'm going to bring this message tonight. And if I'm going to go five minutes longer, that's going to be my, you know. Uh, by a slam dunk to you, you know, or whatever. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying, I remember this time when I was in the Army, and uh, I won't tell you why, but I was walking across the street, and I was distracted. And as I was walking across the street from one military base over to another military base, I was distracted, and I turned and looked behind me. And you know what happened to me? The next thing I knew, I was sitting on the ground, and I was so embarrassed because I ran into a light pole and uh, hit the light pole. I was on the ground and um, I just kind of, and you know, there was traffic around <laughs> too. And I was so embarrassed and I just kind of dusted myself off and shook myself off and everything. But I learned an important lesson that day. 
and that is that you can't walk forward while you're looking backwards. You're going to hit something. So, folks, don't look behind you. Don't look at the past. Don't worry about it. God has got it under control. If you'll just follow him and walk with him, the Holy Spirit will be your cloud by day and your fire by night. Now I see Lorena come on. Lorena, you just got on. And you know what? Uh, for you and for Amy, I did this broadcast at 8 o'clock. I got knocked out three times by power outages. I, I and, and I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this thing all over again. And just for the heck of it, just because I refuse to let the devil have his way, because I brought this message at a church this morning. I cannot say where I brought it because of the things that are going on in California right now. But we had a very well attended live service that was just blessed. And we had a blast with it. And I am so glad that I went and I brought this message there this morning. And I thought, you know what? The rest of the body of Christ needs to hear this message. So if there are some of you and you're worried about being overtaken by your past, I want you to go back, the ones that have just signed on, and listen to this message because I'm going to keep it here. And then I'm going to transfer it to YouTube. And then I'm going to transfer it to my website so it'll be there. And it can never, 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 never be power outage again. Okay? Because it is here. We did it. Okay? We got it accomplished tonight. It took me two hours. I was out of breath the first time. And God gave me a, a Holy Spirit anointed energy to do this again. And so we've got the message, and actually this one is better than the uh, the ones I brought before. I'm going to delete everything that's on there now and just put this up there, and this will be the message. So, folks, I encourage you to listen to this. Go back and to the very beginning and listen. You will be so blessed, okay? Um, and this will help you. Um, uh, and I see Amy and Lorena, and I know there's others that have uh, that are on here also. Uh, but for 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 without i i don't like singling people out you know because i don't want to embarrass people but i i just think that in the a message like this though is is applicable to all of us to every one of us to to you and to you and to me and to all of you that are watching we 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 all need this message when i when i when i when i preach and, and i bring a message many many times i'm speaking to myself as much as i am to you because it's not really me ministering it's the holy spirit ministering through me uh because i don't even plan what i'm what what, what i'm saying i'm uh i'm just sitting here thinking uh uh you know uh, i've got to bring this message it's going to be out of exodus so and so and i have no clue what i'm going to say i don't take notes uh uh, because I prefer to just let the Holy Spirit move, and, and God moves, and he gives me the words, and many times I realize that, you know, uh, Apostle Misha, you're you're speaking to yourself as much as you are to everyone else, and it's true. It really is true. The Holy Spirit does that, though. That is how God moves. That is how we're led by the cloud by day and the fire by night, okay? It's the Spirit of Christ now dwelling within us, okay? So, God bless you. I want to pray a prayer and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for those that have just been diligent enough to come back and come on and hear your word and that will listen to this word and will be blessed by it. I pray that you'll seal it to their spirits, Lord Jesus, so it'll be living within each one of us and in, 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 in me too, Lord. I take this word, just seal it to my own spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord, and we thank you for it. Amen. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming back and listening, and I know there'll be others to listen. If you enjoyed this message, like it because it encourages me. Take it and uh, and hit your share button because all of you got friends that I will never have the opportunity to minister to. But if you hit the share button, they'll be able to hear it, and uh, who knows who they'll share it with, and who knows who that person will share it with, and these messages can go all over the place, okay, and 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 get and, and around the world, and I've got I have comments coming back to me from Thailand and uh, Africa and uh, Pakistan and uh, Europe and in a lot of places that are people that have heard these messages, and sometimes I'll see six or seven likes, and sometimes over a hundred viewers, and so forth and so on. So you know, it, it encourages me if you like the message. And if you like it, it also encourages others to listen because they see the likes and think, well, maybe this is something I ought to listen to uh, and so forth and so on. But the biggest thing that you can do 
If you want to be supportive of our ministry, Misha Softier Ministries, is hit your share button, okay, folks, and share this word with others, okay? I had a couple of announcements before I close and just letting you know because some people are wondering, when are you going to release your book? You keep saying it's ready to come out. I finished all the edits. I did five edits of the book. It's ready to go. Um, I got to write a small little paragraph, which I, I could probably get done in 20 minutes. But I'm in negotiations right now with the publisher. I've got... Uh, I'm dealing with it, trying to decide whether to go with uh, Amazon and let them uh, uh, publish the book or whether to go with uh, 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 w with an agent, okay? And I have several um, age, uh, possibilities there, but um, it's something I just need to pray about because I have to decide once the book is released how, uh, how I want the book marketed, where I want it marketed, and... Um, uh, there are other things that are involved that I don't want to get into uh, here in this forum right here, but it's business, unfortunately, in, in that respect, okay? But the book in itself is something that the Lord came to me and in, 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 in actually told me to write, and I was so shocked at the title of the book and, 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 and very shocked that the Lord would ask me to write it, and I, I actually questioned the Lord, am I really the one to write this book? And the Lord said, just write it, I'll give you the words. And God has been very, very faithful in doing that. And as I go back and I've read this now five times myself to edit it, I realize the wisdom of God in, in, in having me write the book. And there is none other like, none, none like it anywhere. I've looked in bookstores. I've been in Barnes & Noble and every Christian bookstore that's out there. And look, I haven't found a book like this anywhere. And uh, I really believe it's a, a work anointed by the Holy Spirit that will bless you when you get it, okay? So I encourage you to get it, not for me, but get it for yourself and get it for your friends. And it'll be out soon. It's called Escape from Your Past. Um, the first book I wrote was Escape from Your Apostasy. That was a small book. I ghost wrote a few for other pastors and everything. And then finally, I wrote Escape from Apostasy in September of 2015. That was when it was published, and we're in September 2020 now. And I finished, and I'll, I'm hoping that I'll get that one published Five years later, but I've worked on this book for five years. It's almost 400 pages, I think 397 pages long. So, yeah, but, it, but it covers everything you could imagine, and I, I think that you'll be blessed. Okay, so that's enough for this evening. Um, I will see you Sunday. No, I'm sorry, this is Sunday. I will see you Thursday night at 8 p.m. So this is Apostle Misha Softier saying God bless you and have a good night. Bye-bye.